downtown San Francisco. It's the Cube covering RSA North America 2018. Hey, welcome back everybody. Jeff Frick here with the Cube. We're in downtown San Francisco at RSA North America 2018. 40,000 plus professionals talking about security, enterprise security. It's a growing field. It's getting baked into everything. There's a whole lot of uh, of reasons that this needs to be better and more integrated into everything that we do as opposed to just kind of a slap on at the end. And who better to have on who's investing at the cutting edge, keeping an eye on the startups, and Sean Cunningham, our next guest. He's a managing director, Forge Point Capital, the newly named. So uh, welcome to Forge Point Capital, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Jeff, we're pretty excited about it. So we were uh, branded uh, Trident Capital Cybersecurity. We we're a, uh, we f a $300 million cybersecurity only fund. Um, we closed the fund uh, about a year and a half ago. We've invested in a dozen companies and uh, we decided that uh, now is a great time to rebrand. ForgePoint really tells more about what we're doing. We're forging ahead with our Series A, Series B funded companies as well as a few growth equity. So it made a lot of sense, but uh, we were pretty excited about the, the market and obviously RSA with all 1,700 cybersecurity companies makes it interesting. Right, so you've been at this for a while. I wonder if you can speak to some of the macro trends as we've seen the growth of cloud, the growth of IoT will soon be more industrial IoT enabled by 5G. We've got all these automated systems in financial services trading and ad tech that we're going to see more and more of that automated transaction uh, happening. You've got APIs, everything's connected to everything else to, to enable my application. So really, really exciting, a huge growing uh, threat surface, if you will. But at the same time, you know, these are the technologies that are driving forward. So what are you seeing from, from your seat at the table, some of the, the newer, more innovative startups? Jeff, I think you should probably tell me you had all the answers there. <laughs> I talked to a lot of smart people. That's the benefit <laughs> of the job. I think the only two, I think the only two buzzwords you left off was Bitcoin and fraud. Well, we can payments. we can work a little blockchain <laughs> in if you want. Yeah, <laughs> but it, it is it's absolutely uh, been an interesting environment. I've been doing it since 2000 with Intel Capital for 15 years. But what's what's really changed? What hasn't changed is the fact that it's all about the hackers are not be able to monetize this. So that's not going away. The biggest change are the, I guess, overt um, uh, nation state attacks. And so between all of those things, the drivers are just continuing to uh, force cybersecurity be become better and better. And that's why the innovative startups are really, you're seeing these 1700, because the legacy companies can't fix these problems. And you know you talk about all these different uh, paths for, um, for hackers to get in. It's absolutely the case. And um, we, we are really big on areas that, as you mentioned, Jeff, the automation. It has to be about automating, has to be about you know having a real solution for a real problem. You know, you look at let's say fifteen hundred of these security startups, a lot of them are about technology for the sake of technology. And so we're pretty excited about a couple uh, areas. One is application security. Um, if you think about the Equifax hack, you know, as simple as getting into the website and being able to hack into all of the PII data, if you will. And we've invested in a company called uh, Previty. And what they do is they make it easy for the application uh, security folks to meet with the DevOps folks and inject the software into um, these applications. And the reason why that's really interesting is if you think about how long it takes for the DevOps guys to get all their security or all their uh, new updates out through that whole cycle, when you can automate that process and reduce that time to market, that's what it's really all about. So, and then what's your take on GDPR? It's, it's you know, it was passed a little while ago. The the enforcement comes into place next month. You know, it's weird with the, what's going on with Facebook right now. I don't ever hear GDPR in the conversation of, of, of what's going on, and yet it's just around the corner, and it seems like it would be part of that conversation. Do you see is this kind of a, a Y2K moment where there's a lot of buzz and, and the date hits and we get past it and then we kind of move on with our lives, or is this really a fundamental shift in the way that companies are going to have to manage their data? Well, if you, I can show you my scars from investing in <laughs> compliance companies. Um, I, I think the, the winners in that space from a business standpoint are going to be the consulting companies initially, and at some point then the legacy guys are going to be also involved as well as some of the startups. But clearly, until you see some of the large penalties happen, there's not going to be a lot of movement, there's going to be a lot of hand-waving and consulting trying to figure out what's your problem, how do we solve it. 
So you're going to see, I'm sure, on the floor a lot of GB, GDOP stuff, but um, we're, we're being very cautious about where we invest there because, it's, as, as you say, Y2K and a lot of this is going to, there's going to be a lot of FUD. The legacy guys are going to say, oh, we can handle that, same as they did with cloud. Look how long it's taking cloud to get adopted. My God. I mean, GDRP right. is a big piece of that. We did uh, investments in, uh, in that space around uh, CASB, it's called, and we invested in a company called Prelearn. Had great traction, but then it just kind of topped out. So it's it's going to be a it's going to be an investable space, and there's going to be a lot of money dumped in there because it's the uh, you know the, the lemming effect. All VCs are going to follow that. Right. But, um, we'll see what happens. And then on the cloud, you know, with the growth of public cloud with Amazon and and uh, Azure and and Google Cloud Platform, and they've got significant resources that they're investing into the security of their clouds and their infrastructure. And yet we still hear things happen all the time where there's some breach because somebody forgot to turn a switch from green to blue or whatever. Um, how do the startups you know, kind of find their path within these huge public cloud spaces to, f to find a vector that they can concentrate on that's not already covered by some of these massive investments that the big public cloud people are making. Yeah, I think some of the, I, you know, you, you point something out. I mean, if you think about cloud, you think about the public cloud, you think of private cloud and the hybrid model and so on. I think that's really where things are going to be for a while. The big guys, big companies, um, enterprises are not putting their a, a lot of their um, crown jewels out in the public clouds yet. And so the private clouds are equally important to them, and so they have to they have to be secured. And the public cloud, you know, there's definitely they have some good security, but uh, they quietly are uh, implementing security from innovative companies. Also, they're not as public about it because they want to have they're already secure, so don't worry about me. But there's <laughs> there's a lot of opportunity there. Okay, and then when 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 CIOs are talking about security and thinking about security, ultimately they cannot be 100% secure, right? It's just, you, you cannot be. And so it's, it's I always job think, security. Yeah, job security for us, right. I, but I always think of it as kind of an insurance model. Mm -hmm. You know, at some point, you get kind of a, a law of diminishing returns and you've got to start Absolutely. making business trade-offs for the investment. How, how, do, how are these people thinking about this at the same time seeing their competitors and neighbors showing up on the cover of the Wall Street Journal, breach after breach after breach? What's the right balance? How should they be thinking about managing risk and thinking of a risk problem as opposed to kind of a, a castle problem. Yeah, and, and that's the biggest problem with, uh, with CIOs and CISOs right now. It's, it's all about what's good enough. Where do I reach that threshold? And so there is definitely you know, buyer fatigue. And I think it's a matter of there are companies out there that look at the risk profile and are actually giving ratings of what does your environment look like? We just invested in a spin out from we helped uh, spin out a company called CyberCube out of Symantec, and it's insurance, and they're looking at, from a cyber insurance perspective, of what's your risk profile within your organization, and selling, and that data from Symantec, as well as the data they have, and going back to the insurance, the underwriters say, hey, we can show you the risk profile of this company, and you can properly price your cyber insurance now. And we all know how large the cyber insurance market is. So there's a lot of opportunities in that space to really look at the risk factors. All right, well, before I let you go to go visit all the 117 startups, which uh, I'll be looking for your check, I'm sure. <laughs> what <The> is, human <laughs> ATM. <laughs> what, is, what is one or two things that you think about in, in some of the, the more progressive startups that you talk about that, that still hasn't kind of hit the public I yet that they should be thinking about or that we're going to be talking about in a couple of years that's still kind of below the radar. Yeah, you know, if I, if I told you, then everyone else would be that's there. True, so I have to be a little careful. <laughs> no, I think the interesting thing is, you know, a bit of a contrarian view is if you think about consumer space, people really don't want to invest. Investors don't want to put money in the consumer. But you think about Symantec again, LifeLock. Identity protection, $2.3 billion Symantec paid to get LifeLock. That's a lot of money. But if you think about five years ago, how many consumers would pull out their Visa card to buy security? So we think that there's a really a potential opportunity on the consumer side. Now, AV is pretty well scorched earth. A lot of places, a lot of these endpoint things are scorched earth. But consumer might be an interesting place to be able to take these enterprise applications and what I would call the consumerization of security and take some of those interesting applications and solutions and bring them down to the consumer in a bundled type of environment. Yeah, well certainly with all the stuff going on with Facebook now, people's kind of reawakening at the consumer level of, of what's really happening, 
uh, would certainly be uh, yeah. fuel for that fire. We have an investment company called ID Experts, which does breach remediation. And our goal right now is we're continuing to add products from that space to be able to give the consumers a very robust offering. All right, Sean. Well, thanks Good. for taking a few minutes right, out of your Thank day you. uh, from prospecting over pleasure. on the floor. He's Sean thanks. Cunningham. I'm Jeff Rick. You're watching theCUBE from RSA North America 2018 in downtown San Francisco. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.